Welcome, everyone, to the Javed Mafagian Cinema for the discussion tonight on uh, gender and justice. I wanted to uh, begin the evening by acknowledging that we're on unceded Coast Salish territory. Uh, my name is Am Johal. I'm with SFU, uh, SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement. Uh, we have, over the past year, been partnered with Pivot Legal Society on a social justice discussion series, which started last May with a discussion on health, harm reduction, and the law in October, uh, Solutions to Homelessness in Metro Vancouver. And uh, tonight's discussion, it's been a real pleasure working with Pivot Legal Society and with uh, Darcy uh, Bennett uh, specifically. Um, before I pass it on to Darcy to set up the evening and introduce the, the moderator, I just wanted to let you know about May the 15th uh, in this room from 7 to 9 p.m. We'll be having a discussion on Islamophobia and interfaith dialogue with Daniel Tutt, uh, who does work with the Unity Productions Foundation in the U.S on the portrayal of Muslims in the post-9-11 environment uh, in the U.S. I first met the Honorable Donna Martinson a couple of months ago in the Pivot office. And when she emailed me to say she wanted to get together and talk a little bit about our work around the law and violence against women, I was really excited. And then the day came that she was actually arriving, and I realized I had absolutely no idea how to receive a judge. I didn't even know what I was supposed to call her outside of the courtroom. And um, our office is kind of a big warehouse with one little meeting room off to the side. So I was trying to clean it up and get it ready. But inevitably, someone came in with this pile of tents from our housing campaign. And only Doug King can close them. So they were kind of strewn about. And then Scott's dog, that is usually so good and sits under his desk, decided it was going to follow me around. So there I was in this little room with this woman who'd spent 18 years on the bench with my colleague's dog in these tents. And in my sort of discomfort, I realized that most of the time when a woman sits down in front of a judge, it's entirely on the judge's terms, it's in her space, and it's on her timeline. And here I was with this woman who'd made time to come to my space on my timeline. And Donna, she insisted I call her Donna, so that put that problem to rest. And I sat down and we had a really engaging conversation about this system that we both spent a lot of years sort of watching, but from really different vantage points. And at the end of that conversation, Donna said to me, this is the beginning of a conversation and it's going to be ongoing. And it's continuing on tonight and I'm so excited that all of you are here to join us in that and about the amazing group of women who are going to join us up here. But I will let our moderator um, sort of tell you a little bit more about what to expect tonight. Catherine Gretzinger is a journalist. Um, she's an adjunct professor at the UBC School of Journalism and an avid supporter of women's rights, anti-poverty work, and indigenous rights here in Vancouver and across British Columbia. And I'm just going to turn it over to her. Thank you very much, Am and Darcy. Darcy, I have been uh, working in journalism and doing public events like this for a long, long time, more than 20 years, and that was the best introduction Ever. <laughs> what, a, what a great way to get a conversation started, and uh, what a great way to acknowledge the importance of this subject matter. Um, your presence here this evening to see more than 300 people sitting in a rainy, in a room, in a warm room on a rainy night in Vancouver, um, it's a rarity. Uh, you can ask anyone from uh, the people who run the, the theater organizations to people who run these kinds of public events. If the rain comes, the numbers go way down. And that they haven't tonight is a real tribute to um, the importance of the subject matter and the importance to which you consider this subject matter. So I thank you very much, very much for that. As Darcy mentioned, we have an incredible lineup of women uh, tonight who are going to be speaking about their particular areas of interest with regard to justice and gender. And um, among them, if, if we added up all of the uh, hours and weeks and months and years of experience they have, we'd be in the four or five hundred year category if we added them one on top of the other. When you think about the number of... of um, issues that have come up in each of our lifetimes with regard to justice and gender. And then you think about the number of minutes that each of these women have considered working on these subjects. Um, it really does give you pause and, and realize how important it is that we continue to discuss and think through some of these issues. So I just want to say that here's how the evening will work. I'll ask you to please turn off your cell phones. 
I know how tantalizing it is to look for the latest text message, but please uh, resist the temptation for the next couple of hours. We're going to be together until 9 o'clock. Uh, we are going to have a very brief time to take some questions. So what we're going to ask is that if you have a question that you would like to pose to the panel, if you could write it down and get it to one of our volunteers, we'll make ourselves known. And if you could provide us with those questions, we'll try to distill them down and pose a couple of questions at the end so that our panelists have a chance to address them directly. We'll be introducing each of the panelists. They've been given an allotted period of time, so I'm going to give them a one-minute warning when they're getting close, and then I am going to interrupt because we want to make sure that we get through all of these different ideas over the course of the next while. The one thing I do want to say um, before I begin to introduce our panelists is that every one of them has a different approach and a different idea about what gender and justice and the interplay between those things means. And this is not a competitive environment that we're creating here. We're not sort of having a one-upsmanship um, situation. We're putting out all these ideas in the room so that it is really a dialogue, a discussion, things for you to be able to think through. So that's the frame that we're going to be working with. So to begin, it's my pleasure to welcome the Honourable, this is the correct way, the Honourable Donna Martinson, and I know that because of Darcy. She's going to be speaking to us tonight about why the pursuit of equality for women still matters. Let me tell you a little bit about what Donna has accomplished. She is a recently retired justice of the British Columbia Supreme Court, and she continues to serve as a deputy judge of the Yukon Supreme Court. She obtained her LLB from the University of Alberta back in 72, and her LLM from Cambridge University in England in 1987. She was appointed Queen's Counsel in Alberta in 86, after practicing as Crown Counsel in Calgary from 1973 until 1979. And then on to private practice she went, specializing in criminal defense and family law litigation. And she did that from 1979 until 86. Now, while she was in private practice, she kept teaching. She taught family law and uh, worked in the criminal justice practicum at the University of Calgary. She was with the Faculty of Law as an adjunct professor and was head of the criminal law bar admission course for the Law Society of Alberta. She still found time to sleep, I'm promising you. She became a full-time faculty member at the Faculty of Law at the University of BC in 1989, teaching criminal law and supervising students in the criminal program there. Pardon me, in the clinical program there. She was appointed as a judge of the British Columbia Provincial Court in 1991, and in the mid-90s, she was seconded for 18 months to the National Judicial Institute in Ottawa, and there she co-chaired an intensive judicial education program for Canadian judges on equality issues. Donna Martinson was appointed to the BC Supreme Court in 1998, where she dealt with criminal, civil, and family law cases. She chaired the court's family law committee and was instrumental in changing the way the court approaches family law matters. Many of you will remember this churn time in British Columbia. It was pivotal, and those changes uh, continue to this day. She was a member of the Canadian Judicial Council's Working Group on Family Law. She was appointed by the Chief Justice as BC's representative on the Canadian Network of Contact Judges, which deals with international and national child abduction cases. Now, she continues to be a member of the Federal Department of Justice National Advisory Committee on Family Law, and she has focused on legal education on equality issues for law students, for lawyers, and through ju with judges as well throughout her career. And even in retirement, she continues to do so. It is a pleasure to welcome the Honourable Donna Martinson. Thank you so much for those very kind uh, introductions. Uh, as Catherine said, uh, I graduated from law school in 1972, which, as you can figure out, was 40 years ago. And this evening, I've been asked to reflect on the broad topic of gender and justice, an issue that has been very important to me throughout my career. The one thing that I haven't completely figured out yet is PowerPoint, but uh, <laughs> here we go. I'm working on it. 
my, con uh, my conclusion in this respect is that while questions of equality for women and access to justice still very much matter, it has for the most part been ignored or marginalized in the legal and policy discussions about the effect of administration of justice and the allocation of resources. And this is so in spite of the legal requirements that exist in our province, in British Columbia, in Canada, and internationally to provide equality for women. The reason often stated is that women in Canada are equal and that we don't have to be concerned about equality anymore. Some would go so far as to say that Canada's approach to equality for women provides an excellent example to the rest of the world of how to get it right. Canada as a country has many good reasons, I suggest, to celebrate the 30th anniversary of our Charter of Rights and its equality provisions, and many reasons to be proud about the advancements with respect to women's equality that have been brought about by the hard work of both women and men. But Canada is not yet in a position to take international pride in the state of women's equality in this country. I, of course, agree that what we want to achieve is a society in which everyone has the equal benefit of and protection of the law, men, women, boys and girls. And there are equality issues now on the situation um, facing men and boys, but my particular focus is on the situation facing women, and there cannot be equality for everyone if there isn't equality for women. I will briefly consider the historical context of women's legal equality, as the access to justice problems we face today are deeply rooted in the way women's roles and nature have been viewed and the ways laws and policies have reflected those views. And I do appreciate that for many of you in this room, that, that will be a refresher. I will then explain why I say that in in spite of the significant progress that we have made, there is still much to be done. Thinking back to the time when I was at law school, there were all-male judges, there were all-male professors, there were um, almost no female lawyers, uh, and I remember well that law school social events were advertised in the law school building by posters containing pictures of nude women. Family law was not taken seriously at all as an important field of law, and many laws were highly discriminatory against women. Women had almost no rights to property or pensions, most of which were in the man's name, and a very limited right to support for themselves and for the children. Violence was often viewed as a private matter, those cases which did come before the court um, were not dealt with in the criminal courts, but rather in the family courts, which were not viewed, at least, as dealing with real crime. There were highly discriminatory laws and attitudes about women and their credibility, especially if they alleged sexual assault. For example, as you will know, a man could not be convicted on the testimony of a woman alone, as it was said by the male lawmakers that it was dangerous to do so in sexual assault cases. Supporting evidence was needed, a requirement only applied to women in these cases. A textbook on the law of evidence, which was still in use at the time that I went to law school, emphasized the need for this requirement, as you can see on the screen. When I went to law school, it was not a crime for a husband to rape his wife. So yes, you may say, but what about the early 1980s when the Charter and its equality provisions came along? 
Many laws then were formally changed and often became gender neutral. However, deeply ingrained views about women, their roles, and their credibility that had informed the law so pervasively and for so long do not change overnight. And for the most part, a gendered application of the law continued. Some of you may remember the um, famous will women judges really make a different speech uh, that Justice Bertha Wilson, the first woman judge in the Supreme Court of Canada, made back in 1990. Speaking in that year, she said that there was overwhelming evidence that gender-based myths, biases, and stereotypes were deeply embedded in the attitudes of male judges and in the law itself. I agree with one legal academic, now a judge, who said at that time that continuing myths created a new stereotype, the superwoman who needed little support for herself and her children. Support orders for women and children continued to be dismally low. All of this resulted in what has accurately been described as the feminization of poverty in the 1980s and 90s. With respect to custody cases at that time, the lack of acknowledgement of women's roles, the continued indifference to violence against women and children with its power and control issues, and the fact that violence against a mother was thought to be irrelevant to parenting, a view we now know to be completely misguided, led a group of BC advocates for women's equality to publish in 1996 a well-researched, insightful book outlining the problems aptly called Women and Children Last. So where are we now? There has no doubt been significant progress for some women in many areas. However, it is wrong to conclude that this means that we have achieved equality for all women, and particularly the women who face combinations of disadvantages. In BC today, these would include, for example, the many women living in poverty, Aboriginal women, racialized women, women with disabilities, senior women, immigrant and refugee women, and sexual minorities. I agree with the comments of Supreme Court of Canada Justice Rosalie Silberman Abella when she spoke about this question in 1994. And in my view, what she said then still applies today. She said, but for every woman in the thousands whose glass ceiling has been melted, shattered, or raised, there are women in the millions who think a glass ceiling is just one more household object to polish. There is still a gap between what the public thinks has happened to women because several thousand had the luck, guts, finances, friends, encouragement, or supportive partners to break barriers and what is really happening for the majority of women. As Justice Abella put it then, these women are waiting for equality to hit home. They are waiting for the rhetoric of equality they can hear to turn into the reality of equality they can live. Canada, as you know, is a signatory to the United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. That means that Canada agrees with the principles embodied in the convention and agrees to give timely effect to them. The principles recognize that justice for women is a broad concept which, to be meaningful, requires legal, 
economic, and social equality. The components of that equality on a day-to-day -day basis in the lives of women include, as you know, dignity and self-worth, living free from discriminatory treatment, safety and security, including freedom from control exercised by both physical violence and psychological abuse, control of their own bodies, economic security, adequate standard of living in that respect. I like the phrase living wage, and it includes the rights to access to accessible, adequate daycare, affordable housing, education of all kinds, access to health care, and the ability to raise one's children without inappropriate interference in a way that provides the same benefits to the children. The United Nations Implementation Committee with respect to the convention I've referred to has recently expressed concerns about Canada's compliance in several very important areas which you can see on the screen. What has the reaction been? Instead of doing anything significant about these very important concerns, both the federal government and the government of British Columbia have done just the opposite. There have been massive cuts, as you know, to programs and services that disproportionately impact upon women, including the elimination of or marginalization of arms of government which specifically are designed to enhance women's equality. By way of example, only massive cuts by the provincial government to legal aid for family law and the el elimination of legal aid for poverty law have had a dramatic, negative, and disproportionate effect on women who cannot effectively access the courts. Legal aid should be available to assist those most vulnerable in our society, yet it is the most vulnerable who have been excluded. The small amount of money recently provided by the province does not begin to solve the problem. The federal government has essentially silenced advocates who work to ensure equality in the development of the, the law by eliminating the court challenges program for new equality cases, and that government has also eliminated funding for general advocacy work and for research with relating to women's equality, a matter which is of great concern to me. And what about political participation? Sure, there are more women in politics, and that's a good thing. But the number of women, and particularly the number of women in real positions of power, is still wo woefully low. And it leads to limited ability to have influence on the allocation of resources. With respect to the legal profession, there are continuing issues for women's equality within the legal profession itself. Women are leaving in record numbers. With respect to the appointment of judges, while as individuals, the men and women who are judges in this province are hardworking, dedicated people who strive to do justice in each case. There are systemic problems in the appointment process that disadvantage women and minorities. The number of women being appointed to courts is decreasing. Um, it's reported that from April 1st, 2007 to March 2nd, um, 2012, 73% of the appointments were men and 27% were women. Uh, it's reported that a significant majority of people who are appointed as judges were corporate and commercial litigators at large firms. Firms which don't, as a rule, practice family law, an area of particular importance to women. The Globe and Mail recently reported that of the last 100 appointments to federal courts, all but two are white. 
Um, each province has advisory committees which uh, make recommendations to the federal government for appointments to the Supreme Court. The members of that committee in this province, as in others, are, are, as I said, appointed by the federal government, and at this time, they're all men. The government says its appointments are based on merit and legal excellence. These are very subjective criteria and, of course, depend upon the views of uh, those who are recommending the appointments. I respectfully suggest that diversity of background, experience and perspective of those who are judges makes for a more effective judicial system for everyone and assists in making everyone feel that there is justice for all. I want to speak for a moment about issues relating to violence against women. Violence against women is a pervasive problem in British Columbia. Violence has always been and remains a gendered issue. While it is true that women do assault men, the overwhelming evidence is that in cases where serious harm and death are caused, it is almost always situations where men assault women. While it is a serious issue for all women, it has a particularly negative impact on those women with the multiple vulnerabilities um, who I have already described, making them even more at risk. One only has to look at what has been acknowledged already about the treatment of Aboriginal women and girls by the justice system at the Murdered and Missing Women Inquiry to understand the extent of and depth of the problems. It's shocking to me that though we know both the nature of and the extent of the problems and the solutions based on the many recommendations that have been made, we continually see women subjected to violence, including death after death. And while much hard work has been and is being done by dedicated advocates for women's equality and some others in the area, there is no comprehensive, well-resourced, system-wide approach in place to protect women subjected to violence. It is important when speaking about violence to recognize the very good work done by the BC Ministry of Justice in enacting the new Family Law Act, which will come into force sometime next year, we hope. Um, among other things, the new legislation recognizes the significance of violence to the issue of parenting, a very important step. But unless the financial and other resources are made available to make it work, and unless the legislation is accompanied by education in this area, it will be very difficult to implement. The final issue I want to speak about is the ongoing problem of how women's credibility is assessed, particularly in relation to sexual violence. Myths and stereotypes about women's credibility are still with us in the justice system. After the laws were changed in the 80s and the 90s, there has continued to be efforts to inappropriately bring these myths and stereotypes into the criminal and family justice processes. Several were reviewed just 13 years ago when the need arose um, by then Supreme Court of Canada Justice Claire Leroux Dubay in the Ewan Chuck case, uh, and you can uh, see that on the screen. BC Women's Hospital in Vancouver has a sexual assault service. The service providers became concerned about the way in which these cases were being dealt with and very recently conducted a study. As you can see, of 568 sexual assault files over a two-year period, 
240, 291 women decided to report their sexual assault cases to the police, um, and only some 48 um, went into the court system. And in the end result, um, in this study, there was a conviction rate of 6%. This, of course, is concerningly low and may relate to views about women's credibility. There may also be many other reasons for this, but it is certainly worthy of further study, a result that is unlikely given research um, funds that have been cut. I will conclude now. There are many more issues that I could raise. But I'm now going to turn the discussion over to the real experts in this area, including the day-to-day -day advocates for women who too often have their views either not listened to at all or dismissed as being the views of special interest groups as opposed to what I prefer to call special knowledge groups as if they are somehow lobbying for the right to build a pipeline, as opposed to advocating for the rights of all women to justice and equality. Thank you. So I guess on the list of advantages that you had guts would have been uh, <laughs> the one that helped propel you forward. Thank you for your generosity and your intellect and your determination. Thank you very much. Dahlia Israel is our next speaker tonight, and her subject is Women Against Violence Against Women, Rape Crisis Center, Seeking Justice in a Rape Culture, the Challenges Women Face Before the Courts. Let me tell you just a little bit about Dahlia. She was born and raised in Vancouver and is a first-generation Canadian. She identifies as a white Jewish feminist woman. She attended both Langara College and UBC, where she focused her studies and graduated with a BA in Women's Studies and Sociology. She's been involved with WAVA since 2002. She's had experience working in the volunteer program, with victim services program, and with the outreach program. She's also had the opportunity to be part of WAVA's superpower project as a youth educator, and she currently works as the victim service program coordinator. Dahlia Israel. Wow, that was a hard act. This is going to be a hard act to follow. Thank you, Donna. It's, um, I was sitting there thinking about how lovely it is to hear from the bench uh, and actually feel like there's an incredible amount of support and solidarity in, in what we're, I think, all going to say tonight. So it was really wonderful to hear your words. Thank you. Um, so. Uh, thank you, Pivot and Darcy, tonight for having us here. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge that we have the privilege of living and working on unceded Coast Salish territory every day. Um, and I also wanted to take the time to just acknowledge the fact that we're in a building that Gold Core uh, has funded and that that has significant meaning for particularly tonight, I think. Um, we can't forget that environmental justice and gender justice is inextricably linked and that colonization in all of its forms has devastating effects on women and the communities that they live in. So I just wanted to start out by acknowledging that. So as Donna finished by saying, this topic is massive and figuring out what to leave you with in eight minutes was the challenge of my week. Um, so I want to just start off by saying that tonight I'm not going to be and we decided that we will not be speaking to police responses around sexualized violence. That we know many of our allies and activists in the community have been working diligently to require accountability from police services around the province. So tonight, 
Um, we will be focusing on Crown Council and the judiciary, mainly because of the power that they both hold in decision making about women's experiences with sexual violence before the court and the current lack of accountability to the public and specifically women. A quick trigger warning that some of the images we're going to use are um, provocative. They may draw up some strong feelings. Um, and I think that they, we, they should. Um, we are, after all, talking about violence against women and some of the most horrific violence that um, we know of. I feel so often that we've become incredibly desensitized from the realities of sexual assault. We see it every day on CSI, on law, law and order. We hear about it in our communities, through our media, but most of us never really have to look at it head on. We felt like it was important for us as a rape crisis center to actually name and remind ourselves what it is that we're actually talking about before we get into how the law is implicated in our experiences. The reality is that one out of every three women sitting in this room has already or will experience sexual assault during her lifetime. Sexual assault is not something that just happens and you get on with life and you forget. It interrupts, it changes our worldview, safety has to be redefined, we carry the shame of the violence that was enacted upon us. The implications can be so significant that women can no longer stay on this planet and end up ending their lives. So I just want to take a minute and ask everyone in the room to reflect on their last sexual experience with yourself or with someone else. So just take a moment. Everybody got it? OK. Now turn to the person to your left and tell them in detail about everything that just came to your mind. <laughs> OK, OK, OK. Don't. Don't actually do it. We don't want anyone to walk out of the room. But think about what that felt like in that moment of contemplating how you were going to rearrange what you just thought of and how you were going to describe that to the person next to you. Now imagine for a moment if that last experience wasn't one that you consented to and actually that somebody who felt entitled took that from you. This is what we're actually asking women to do over and over when they're contemplating engaging with the criminal justice system. Imagine the devastation then when you're told by a system that purports to deliver justice that your experience just doesn't make the cut, that there's no formal recourse or action that you can take after you've been told this, and that this is the reality when Crown is given complete discretion with no required transparency or explanation about their decisions when they stay charges. So why do we see this over and over again? Like Donna pointed out, as Canadian society, we do purport to believe that it's wrong to hurt women. That as women, we are entitled to equal rights, safety, and dignity. That our state is expected to take all appropriate measures, including legislation, to ensure the full development and advancement of women by offering us these things. And that there are laws to back this up laws that feminists and their allies have been fighting hard for for decades. But the true question is, do we actually ground our practice in response to sexual violence against women in law? Or is it more accurate to say that we ground it in culture? We would argue that we aren't doing a very good job of actually grounding our responses in law.
We can't even begin to discuss the issues that women face when trying to have their sexual assaults heard before the court if we don't back up for a minute and realize the context and culture that we currently live and breathe in. We know that we're all influenced by our social context. So when we have human beings running the systems that are meant to provide us with justice, it is imperative that we contextualize the realities in which these individuals are living and breathing in as well. In the first image, we have a group of Zeta Psi fraternity pledges posing in front of the Yale Women's Center with a sign that says, we love Yale sluts. These are our next Americas, next best lawyers, judges, and politicians. This was the year after George Bush's old fraternity on the same campus posted a video online of pledges chanting, no means yes and yes means anal in a circle outside of the women's freshman dorms at night. In the second image, <clears throat> the second image is from Maxim Magazine. I'm sure everyone is aware of Maxim Magazine. This is a four step how to guide to cure a feminist to make her a good woman who is far less closed and ready for action and not the activist type of action. The third image is what we're using to sell skateboards to our youth, a clear indication of what we want our youth to know about a woman's worth. So from Ivy League educational campuses to an innocent perusal of a magazine, we're told over and over by this rape culture about women's status in our society. This is an obvious contradiction to the laws and social values that we just saw. This cultural climate is not only socializing men to feel entitled to women's bodies and have expectation of women as purely objects, but it also grooms women to tolerate and expect these types of experiences. One minute, okay. Oh, time now, completely. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, um, so I guess I just want to say that we're often told that justice is blind, that the criminal justice system is meant to take a neutral stance, but um, where do we think the judiciary and Crown Council sit? They don't sit outside of culture. Um, we just saw the Yale students. Um, so I think it's important that we recognize that those that are inside the criminal justice system do not wear an impermeable shell that allows all of this rape culture to roll off of them. And so when they are dealing with women, um, it, we believe that it has a huge impact on the way they make decisions. And these are from the media, news headlines that we see over and over again. Um, and I think what, what women make meaning of is that the state is apathetic and really just doesn't care. There's no space for women to access the criminal justice system. So I'll just leave with this. And that is just that um, we do have good laws, good enough for now, and that we really do call on Crown and the judiciary to uphold the laws of the land, to investigate their own biases and how the current rape culture impacts them, to unpack their learnings, to think about how they deal with women as witnesses, to recognize the significant impact of these processes on women's lives and their decisions on women's lives. And we will continue this work with the University of Alberta this summer. And we all have a hand in stopping rape. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dahlia. Grace Tate is our next speaker tonight. Grace was born in Prudence Rupert, British Columbia, but she's been living in Vancouver for more than 38 years now, primarily just down the road in the downtown east side and in Strathcona. Grace is from the Shimshan Nation, and she's a proud member of the Eagle Clan. She is also the proud mother of two young adult children and the grandmother of two. 
She has been a very active member in the community in the past for volunteering on various boards of directors, including the Vancouver Native Health Society, the Vancouver Aboriginal Friendship Centre Society, the Britannia Community Services Society, the Bantam and Court Youth Housing Society, the Network of East Vancouver Community Organizations, and I could go on and on. This woman has worked relentlessly in the community. She's also volunteered on many Vancouver and provincial committees, working primarily for families and children. She's had a wide variety of work experiences thanks to opportunities provided to her by the community. She's been involved in a long list of programs and activities here as well. As the coordinator of the Vancouver Aboriginal Transformative Justice Services Society and also she's currently with the Inner City Early Childhood Parent Coordinator for the RayCam Cooperative Centre. And she's also the program support staff with ALIVE, which is the Aboriginal Life in Vancouver Enhancement Society. And Grace is here to speak to us tonight. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to thank the Coast Salish people for allowing me to live and work in their unceded territory, their beautiful territory. Um, Alive, Aboriginal Life in Vancouver Enhancement Society is the organization that I primarily work with dealing with many issues, and child welfare happens to be one of the priority areas. Um, we all know the problems with the, the system, especially for Aboriginal families, especially for Aboriginal mothers, and the impacts to their children in a system that isn't healthy. Um, ALIVE is an organization that is not building services or programs. It is uh, a fairly new organization that will be two years old in May. It is an organization that is not meant to build administration or um, have uh, uh, at a cost that to, to the community of, of, of building empires, as, as some people put it. It's about linking community members um, to their neighborhoods and to what's in their neighborhoods and, and, and it's called place-based strategies. What ALIVE is trying to do is develop an urban Aboriginal strategy. We sadly are lacking in any kind of planning with regards to urban Aboriginal peoples and child wel welfare falls under that um, as one of the, the main topics that Aboriginal families have to deal with on a constant basis. Um, and it's, everyone that's talked about the 60s scoop in the past, you only have to go to the courts today to see the impact to Aboriginal families in those courtrooms. It's astonishing. And the numbers aren't getting lower. Um, Alive is about helping people empower themselves in their neighborhoods. It's about empowering them in their uh, community centers, in their libraries, in their schools, whatever is, is, is there for everybody in the community, is there for Aboriginal people. And we've learned this through the Urban Aboriginal People's Study, which I encourage you all to, to take a look at in terms of ab what Aboriginal people would like to have um, in their lives and, and be part of its aspirations that you all have. It is not about um, segregating ourselves, but having the choice uh, just as any other Canadian would. It's about um, changing the way that uh, the larger community views us and how we like to engage with each other. Um, it talks about the, the uh, willingness to, to work together and to uh, change what's happening for Aboriginal families in positive ways. And that's a big thing for, for ALIVE. Uh, we have a board of directors, we have elders, we have many volunteers, and the, the most significant thing um, that we have is our, our non-Aboriginal partners. It's a lesson learned um, from, from doing this work for a long time. Um, one of the first uh, uh, campaigns that I was part of in an Aboriginal organization was called Stop Taking Our Children Away. And it was very significant in the fact that we had worked with parents and their kids 
to support each other, peer support, staff support, community support, to actually keep our kids from the ministry. And we were very successful. We, we, we had our research to back us up. We actually had a pilot project that was very successful um, in terms of being run by a mom um, who had connections in the community and was working with our traditional parenting program, um, connecting with uh, counselors, connecting with family support, being proactive, and heading off the problem uh, with treatments and prevention before there was a major problem. But within our success, the of course, the bureaucrats and politicians didn't like this. And so we s saw the funding um, for that organization slowly being taken away. And the biggest lesson that we've learned from that is we can't do it all on our own. We need the larger community to work with us, stand beside us, help us figure out the solutions, because there's many solutions out there. So with Alive, um, what we have done in terms of um, partnering with community initiatives, the inner city response strategy, is here in the downtown east side that works with many groups and we have many tasks. There are different tables, uh, round tables, and the groups work with pr medical professionals. We work with schools, we work with uh, frontline nursing staff, we work with um, other community uh, providers, uh, and we work with parents and grandparents and seniors and elders. And what what we are working towards is our going back to our indigenous ways. It's very important to us. And we're trying to bring those back in different ways. Um, but one of the things is that all we always come back to and what our elders remind us, we had successful family, family units all through our, our histories, our rich histories in different nations and territories. We had systems that worked. We had systems that protected our children, our, 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 our elders, our women. We honored our women. With the systems that we have in place now, that honoring has been taken away. And we have a very active group of, of alive members that are ready to take this back on our own terms, in our own ways. We know there's problems, but we are all about the solutions and successes. And those successes, uh, I'll just give you a recent uh, situation of an alive member. She was asking for support in terms of respite care because she has many children. And instead of giving her that support, the delegated agency decided to remove her children. And in, instead, what she had done before was fall apart and fall back into her addictions and not follow through on anything um, for a while until she grieved. She decided this time, because of her work in a group that's under the inner city response strategy called Parent to Parent, and that's a peer support group. They're working, they're learning together. They're actually meeting with MCFD social workers. They're meeting with team leaders. They're getting to know the systems. They're, they're um, arranging for people to come as guest speakers to talk about the various um, programs in the neighborhood and outside of the neighborhood. So when she decided her plan of action would be to be proactive, to get her lawyer in place and then all her supports, the next, the next week when she had to go to court, she had probably 50 people with her at the courthouse. It was amazing. She, she had, had her instructed her lawyer, they had already worked out what the plan was going to be, and she just wanted witnesses there to see that this could happen. A community could come together, and she proved it. And the, her children were released to her within an hour. She went to pick them up and was very happy that to be reunited with them. And, and then it was time to get the kids the help they needed because it's traumatizing to them. Um, and then she had a community potluck get-together dinner to thank all of those people that came to support her. We need more things like that to come together as a community, and we need all of you. 
So thank you very much for listening to me tonight. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, put it on the piece of paper or uh, hand me your business cards. We'd be happy to meet with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grace. Um, this is a good time to remind all of you, we've heard from three speakers. We have three more to go. If you do have questions, please jot them down and just uh, hold your hand up and we'll make sure to make our way through and get them so that we can present them at the end of the evening. Kasari Gavender is our next speaker. She is the Executive Director of West Coast Legal Education and Action Fund, otherwise known as LEAF. LEAF works to achieve equality by changing historic patterns of discrimination against women through public legal education, litigation, and law reform. In addition uh, to working with LEAF, Kasari works to represent organizations in interventions in equality rights litigation, such as the polygamy reference case that so many of us are familiar with. She was also the co-author of the 2010 report entitled Rights-Based Legal Aid, Rebuilding BC's Broken System. Now, before joining LEAF, Kasari practiced constitutional equality in Aboriginal law. She earned her degree in law from the University of Victoria, her master's degree in international human rights law from the University of Oxford. Underachiever, she is. She sits on the board of the Pivot Legal Society. She co-chairs both the Coalition on Public Legal Services and the Canadian Bar Association's Social, Social Justice Section. And today, she is going to be speaking to us about public interest standing, who... Who is it who gets through the courtroom door? Kasari. Uh, it's a pleasure to see so many people out to join this conversation about gender injustice. Uh, it's actually an inspiration, so thank you. Um, as I've been thinking about how to prepare for today's talk, uh, I was reflecting back on last year's, last week's 30th anniversary of the Charter, as, as Donna was talking about. Um, and like all birthdays, uh, this was a time to take stock. While there have been some important victories, as well as losses and compromises in the last 30 years, one of the most significant challenges to the integrity of the Charter as an effective human rights document is not so much measured by the win-loss record, but really whether equality and other human rights claims are even getting to the courts. And that's what I want to spend a few minutes talking about today. How do women get their rights claims through the courthouse doors? How do equality claimants uh, hold the government accountable to the Charter? Imagine for a moment with me that you are a woman seeking an abortion and you have to pay for that service in the midst of an emotional, highly personal and time sensitive decision to end a pregnancy. Do you launch a constitutional challenge to the funding scheme for abortions in your province? Or imagine that you're a sex worker who's being charged with a prostitution related offense. Likely you are young, street involved, struggling with addiction problems. You don't qualify for legal aid because you won't be sent to jail. Do you walk into court by yourself and announce that you have a Section 15 equality challenge to, to the constitutionality of the criminal code? Likely not. All of, um, sorry, in part, bringing these claims to court means a, a number of things. Claimants need to know that they have a potential legal claim. They need to know they have the means to hire a lawyer that can get them through a lengthy legal battle. They need to have the mental health to ensure they're able to give their counsel coherent instructions and the lifestyle choices to stay in touch with counsel for a multi-year period. They need to be willing to put their names and stories into the public eye and they need to be willing to submit themselves to media scrutiny. All of these are huge demands that we put on those to see, who seek to uphold and enforce our constitution. There's a lot riding on the choice of individuals to subject themselves to these demands. And the impact is clear for all of us. A lot of claims will never be brought if we have to rely entirely on individuals to bear this burden, which is where the concept of public interest standing comes in. Standing is a legal concept that describes the um, legal ability to bring a case to court. So what cases will the court hear? The regular way a plaintiff becomes a plaintiff is through the you hurt me, now I'm going to sue you kind of typical model. 
Public interest standing, on the other hand, is when an individual or a group brings a claim on behalf of the public or of a particular portion of the public that's affected by a law. They bring the claim on behalf of those who don't have the resources uh, to bring the claim on their own. The court gets to decide who gets public interest standing. Public interest standing is granted when there's a serious issue to be tried, a and the, the party has a genuine or direct interest, and most importantly, where there is no reasonable and effective alternative for the issue to become to court. So where there is no reasonable or effective alternative. It's this last part that is often the biggest obstacle for public interest litigants to overcome. Could the case be brought before a court some other way by someone who is more directly impacted? This seems to be the hardest point for some courts to understand. Because what if the obstacles to bringing the case are not some concrete tangible, but are because of the marginalization or vulnerability of those who are being harmed? And let's face it, those who need the protection of the charter mostly, most are those precisely who are most marginalized. Those who have reason to challenge the law are those who are rendered most vulnerable to it. In these circumstances, a group or other individual who has the physical or other resources to bring a claim must be able to step in and bring it on behalf of those who don't. So to return to those earlier examples, the first one's a good story. Henry Margenthaler has been trying for year, many years to bring a case, a new one, not the one we all know about, but a case to bring, um, bring, to bring regarding the funding scheme for abortions in New Brunswick on behalf of the women whom the policy harmed. It was argued by the government that he didn't qualify for public interest standing because the case could be brought for women who'd had to pay for abortions themselves and therefore were directly impacted by the law in question. Remember our imagining scenario from earlier. The New Brunswick Court of Appeal disagreed, finding that the prohibitive cost of the litigation, as well as the intimate and private nature of the decision to terminate a pregnancy, effectively prevents the women who are directly impacted by the law from bringing the matter before the courts. This is public interest standing at its best. The second example, we're not really sure if it's a good story or not yet. This is the sex worker case. The Supreme Court of Canada recently heard the case of SWAV, which stands for Sex Workers United Against Violence. This, um, the government has approved the, uh, appealed this case, sorry, um, which was a ruling by the BC Court of Appeal that held that SWAV, this is the, the group that brought the claim, had public interest standing. This case is about a group of current and former sex workers who on their own faced innumerable challenges to bringing a constitutional challenge to court of the type I've already discussed. But banding together as a community, a community organization, bringing a case in their corporate identity, they could maintain their anonymity, increase their stability as a client to provide instructions to, to counsel, and provide support to one another in the struggle to bring that, this case to the court and to the public eye. And for the court, this means that they could have access to evidence of women who are highly marginalized by the very law in question. And they could have access to a broad range of experiences that a single plaintiff simply couldn't bring. The irony here is that this issue of whether the, case, the group gets standing has taken years to resolve and still isn't over yet. All this while a case was brought in Ontario by three non-street-based sex workers on the substantive issue of the constitutionality of the criminal code, and so likely Suave's case will never be heard. The future of public interest standing is currently unknown. If the court's grandstanding to Suave, even though they likely won't make a difference for the plaintiff in this particular case, it may open the doors to ensuring that plaintiffs like this, um, get before the, cake, the, before the court and the public interest cases are heard. It may open the doors to ensuring that the charter is actually enforceable even when there's marginalized and vulnerable plaintiffs involved who do not have the resources to bring the claim themselves. If Suave is denied standing, the court may be shut on resolving many human rights complaints that we are currently facing. In some ways, this may seem like a technical principle of law, this issue of standing. But in fact, it's one of the keys to unlocking our justice system. It's one of the keys to ensuring that the, open, that the courthouse doors stay open and ensuring that human rights are, are, are upheld in this country. Thank you. <laughs>